Spags, it's been a long, dark winter of you and I not drafting best ball teams together, but today that finally changes. This is what we've been waiting for all offseason. We're ready to hop into a 2023 fantasy football draft. Underdog has 200K up top in their big board, and Pete and I couldn't resist it. So we're going to hop in there right after this very short intro. <music> Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Splash Play. Pete is back from Arizona. I am back from the worst Super Bowl weekend ever, and we are currently in a big board draft room. So if you want to play along with us on Underdog, use that promo code SPLASH. Double your deposit up to $100. Get in the mix now. All the rookies in here, all the players, all the ADPs are batshit insane, as I teased in this title of the video. But Pete, you did some big board drafts, including... I believe the first legal one in the entire globe when you were in Arizona. So what are your initial thoughts here on how to handle a big board draft for 2023? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this is our first draft that includes the rookie. So that's a pretty fun wrinkle. We also have a completely new quarterback landscape with multiple quarterbacks going in the first, you know, three rounds, which is definitely a big departure from last year. We have lots of what I would consider value at tight end, basically throughout the draft, basically whatever structure you want to do, kind of sliding the tight ends at different points seems viable. And yeah, and also I think some mispriced wide receivers right now. I actually don't feel the wide receiver avalanche quite as much as I thought I would, partly because the quarterbacks are pushing down some of these wide receivers. But like just off the top of my head, a guy like DJ Moore, I find his price to be absurd. And so I've actually been surprised in like rounds five through seven, how many wide receivers there are that I actually like. I've been surprised when I end up in some pockets in these drafts and there is not a single player I want to take, like not on the entire screen, nowhere visible. It's all running back. So I consider dust wide receivers. who I consider to be on the worst side of things. You know, Pete talked about their DJ Moore, 60 ADP on him. If you see the screen right now, the QBs, I'll pull them up here real fast. Um, I guess I'll unselect the other comms. Why is this not loading the right way? Okay, there we go. Uh, this is slow clicks here. Of course, the underdog interface working out its kinks as we go as well. High ADPs for Mahomes, high ADPs for Josh Allen. Does this surprise you at all with the QB stuff? Because we saw last year, I mean, Pat Corain, the great Pat Corain, won with guys taken very late in drafts for the most part. Three QBs, of course, in his build that won the Best Ball Mania 3 tournament. This year, you're seeing all these guys get steamed up. And it feels incorrect to me. It feels like this is a market that's just drafting not the way you're supposed to draft. Um, does that seem right to you? Or I guess I, I'm just like blown away by these ADPs from doing three drafts so far. Yeah, I think the ADPs for like Mahomes and Allen and Hertz are pretty efficient, like relative to what they can do for you in a tournament standpoint. Um, it still feels rich, even if they are efficient. And then it's that next tier that are really getting pushed up. Like when I see these drafts where Trevor Lawrence goes in the third and fourth round and these guys that don't have the sky high rushing upside uh, or just being the best quarterback ever and Patrick Mahomes, like that's where I start to get queasy and so I'm sure if these ADPs hold, I will bite the bullet and get my exposure to those top three guys, but I will probably be largely out on that next tier if those prices hold, because there's so much you can find, whether it's stability with a Kirk Cousins later, whether it's upside with a Trey Lance like or a Jordan Love, like these guys exist for far cheaper to a, I find his price very palatable. So I just don't think I want to pay premium prices in the fourth and fifth round for these guys that I don't think can finish as the QB one. Yeah, I'm with you. I also think the rookies too, like I know we've talked about, um, I've certainly, if you've watched some of the videos on the channel, and if you haven't, I would recommend checking out the playlist on the Splash Play channel of the rookie previews I did going position by position for the skill position guys coming in. Uh, I think people's lack of understanding of the rookies too is driving down those prices a lot. This is a fantastic tight end class, and those guys are all going 175 or later, but we are on the board, Pete. A.J. Brown, Jonathan Taylor, I think a case could be made for both guys. Taylor getting new head coach, Shane Steichen. A.J. Brown, of course, a beast and going to be real mad based on what he said to Juju. Uh, who do you want to go with here? Uh, I mean, you know me. Uh, I'd definitely be down with A.J. Brown or, or C.D. Lamb. Okay, let's do A.J. Brown. I think C.D. Lamb, there's a risk the Cowboys bring in somebody that kind of takes some of his load away just because of how that offense performed this year. Um, but I think A.J. Brown, to me, you know, the Eagles, we saw they can create production for all those guys. If anything, that got better as the year went on. With A.J. Brown, Devonta Smith, Dallas Goddard all getting there in various ways. Um, Jonathan Taylor, though, I think kind of a nice pick at the end of the first round because I really think they are going to establish a hardcore on the Colts next year. 
Yeah, and I think, I mean, Gretch and I, when we did it, well, it was a ship chasing draft the other week, and we took, I think, uh, we took Jonathan Taylor in the second round, of course, because he fell to us there. The one, I think the reason I said A.J. Brown is because I'm looking at these names, and I'm seeing the start of this draft, and it does start to feel like a bit of an avalanche room. Like, these drafters mm-hmm. here in the middle, our guy Will, Willis, I think you see the the Hill Cup digs Adam stretch. When those guys are going ahead of Jonathan Taylor, it tells me that we might not get some wide receivers coming back. I also think to be Tyreek's a little bit overvalued. I think this is the year that Jalen Waddle makes a leap. Like I was looking at some of the advanced analytics guy was an absolute beast out last year. Uh, but we have Mahomes on the board. We have Bijan. We have Saquon Barkley, who I will not allow us to take Amon Ra. Uh, which of these guys stand out to you? Uh, Bijan has been kind of the guy I've been taking here. If Bijan too. For Amon Ra, if Hertz was here, I would have maybe said, let's just bite the bullet and stack it up. But I, I think Bijan's probably the pick. Yeah, I'm with you on Bijan. Bijan, of course, rookie coming in, going to be definitely a first-round pick. Where he goes might be a little bit tough to figure out heading into the NFL draft because there's a lot of great rookie running backs out there. Um, Bijan, certainly the best of them, though. High missed tackle rate, looking pretty good. Uh, EPA number strong across the board. Bijan, let me see if I can pull that up. 0.396 EPA on pass plays, 0.122 EPA on run plays. Those are both elite marks coming out of college. So Bijan, I think, Pete, I hate taking a rookie this high because he could certainly land somewhere where he's like, Brees Hall's fill in until Brees Hall comes back or something. But I think that's where I'm willing to take on the risk because I think he is uniquely talented. Yeah, I do too. I mean, yes, we aren't getting like a huge discount on him here, but I do feel pretty confident that unless he goes to like a true disaster of a landing spot or some team goes wild and drafts him into a backfield that already has an established guy, like say if the Saints took him and it was like him and Alvin Kamara and you're like, well, yeah, you're not going to be playing a lot of passing downs, whatever. Like I would understand some of the concern, but I think in most situations, Bijan is going to settle as a back end of round one pick and who knows i think he has the room to go even higher just when you look at how thin it is for being excited about these running backs right after cmc after eckler after jt like it gets really barren quickly and it feels so natural for Bijan to slide in as that running back four and i do think he'll be a fixture of the back end of round one Paul asking, what are some teams that would make Bijan a monster year in 2023? And also Dustin saying, just cemented Bijan going to Philly now. I think if he went to Philly, that'd be great if he were the Miles Sanders replacement. But do you have any sort of read on this? Because I think he can go to the Cowboys. I think the Bills are still live to take a running back with Devin Singletary likely leaving in free agency. Uh, there are so many backs that could leave in free agency. And if teams are smart, they're going to let them leave. That I think Bijan can go a lot of places and be a bell cow or be a 1A, 1B kind of back. But I think there's a lot of flexibility for him to get there. Do you have any leans? Um, yeah, I mean, like at the back end of the draft, obviously people have started mocking him to the bills. I have such a hard time, like detaching what would actually be good for fantasy and just being like, God, the bills would be so stupid to spend that pick on Bijan instead of a pass catcher or whatever. Yeah. I think the Eagles is a good one. Um, could you, do you think the, I mean, the Ravens are a pretty well-run organization and they don't blow their draft picks, but Bijan on the Ravens, I think would be pretty fun. He got mocked there by Todd McShay today because I was reading that okay, before he the did. show. Yeah, so that that's, that's you're not alone in that thought. Apparently, he's one of those guys that could go anywhere, and it like because of the draft capital you're going to have to use to take him, especially relative to running backs. Like he's going to get fed the ball pretty much no matter where he goes. Yeah. Um. Someone in the chat mentioning Raiders and they let Jacobs walk. That could be fun, especially if the Raiders get Rogers and then you have Bijan back there. That that would. I mean, if he goes to the Raiders in that scenario, he's for sure like one nine one ten in most drafts. Yeah, I'm with you. I also think, so I have to point out the Saquon thing. I think Saquon is being greatly overvalued in these drafts. And I've talked about it enough times throughout the year. People know my Saquon takes. I know a lot of people out there love Saquon. He's a guy that had the highlight reel plays, looked great in college against my alma mater, USC. I get all that. But he, to me, is just like a replacement back. Like there's nothing, no negative or negative EPA numbers, excuse me, in passing and rush plays. He's also not great according to DVOA. So there's no metric that says he's great besides volume. And I think these are the backs, Pete, that I've learned to start to worry about a little bit more. And obviously, Mike Davis a couple of years ago is not the greatest comp for Saquon Barkley. But if you assume Saquon's going to get 20 touches, if the Giants don't want to pay that contract, he can go somewhere at a decreased deal and kind of end up in a, a bad game of musical chairs for himself. I think there's a lot of ways that he's not going to pay off this price tag. And I just don't think he should be a middle second round guy. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I I definitely he's a guy that I think you want a discount on. The hard thing I have that I wrestle with is like I want to be in on this Giants offense just because I was so impressed with Dayball this year. I think if they could add any bit in the pass catching room, whether that's someone in free agency or they draft someone that emerges, then this offense could start to get fun and maybe it takes the pressure 
off of Barkley a little bit, but in general, I agree with you. His profile, his kind of dropping efficiency, he is a guy that you should be a little worried about. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of these guys that we're going to see here. And I think really the main thing that jumps out to me besides the quarterback stuff, there are so many running backs that are like name players that are going in the 50s, 60s, 70s, Alvin Kamara, Dalvin Cook, like guys who have had a really tr high track record of getting drafted pretty highly over the last few years. I think those players, to me, Pete, like I think they're appropriately priced, but I feel like the field's going to steam them up because I've seen so many drafts so far on Twitter. People like, oh, I got Dalvin and like all these. And it's like Dalvin might not have a job next year. Yeah. And I mean, isn't Dalvin going to be getting surgery too? Um, yeah. First time he, you know, he had been playing through this essentially um, and never biting the bullet and getting the surgery. So that adds another wrinkle, you know, his rehab coming back from that too. So yeah, I'm with you. Um, you're going to want discounts on some of these older running backs who are starting to age out of the league. The one guy though, and we'll see what, uh, what Mar Manavon here does in front of us. If Josh Jacobs is there, I think he's one back that I would not mind taking just because I think to sign him, you are going to have to pay a pretty penny. And analytically, he was better than average in every possible metric. Again, the Football Outsiders ones, of course, that I extol, footballoutsiders.com slash subscribe. Always going to look good there. DYAR looked great. His DVOA looked great. His EPA looked great. These are a lot of acronyms throughout there. I wouldn't mind taking Josh Jacobs here, but I also think Justin Fields is a nice value because I don't see how he's going to not be good this year. Yeah, I would do Jacobs because the quarterback, uh, they're the team on the turn, double tap quarterback. So there's like zero chance he would take one. Um, so yeah. I, I think I would just pull the trigger on Jacobs. And I, I do, I do agree as much as I like some of the depth that wide receiver in the, you know, fourth through seventh round, this is a dead pocket in the draft for me. Um, I don't like a lot of these names that are here at, at cost. Do you like fields? I do. Okay. How about Jackson? Yeah, I, I like both of them. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm kind of now going back on what I just said about not wanting to pay the, the price, um, for these guys compared to like, if you're telling me like Hertz in the second versus fields in the third, um, I start to, you know, just give me Hertz, but S Spidey took two QBs, 12, 12 and 13. Start, yeah. That, okay. Um, I guess that's where we are. I don't think Amari is the pick for us maybe Kittle if we want to get an elite tight end and, or we could bite the bullet and do Lamar or Justin Herbert. Yeah. I also don't even mind scrolling down and taking like a Godwin um, or something. A guy, I think he's a little mispriced, but yeah, this is a gross spot. I'm going to say, let's take Lamar because I do think there's right. a, a renaissance coming for him. New offensive coordinator for the Ravens already. Uh, Todd Munkin, who was the offensive coordinator at Georgia last year, hopefully learned some stuff in a stint playing in college and or not playing in college, coaching in college, uh, but also coaching a really good Georgia team. I think Lamar is going to take an upgrade, assuming that he stays there. If not, he'll get traded. They'll build the offense around him somewhere else. Um, but I think to me, uh, who's the name you mentioned there? I'm sorry. I'm spacing already. Godwin was the name Godwin. I mentioned. So the Bucks right now, uh, bottom four in NFL futures to win the Super Bowl, which kind of worries me that there could be really bad times that for the Bucks. Yeah, I I think that based on just like the talks from their team and stuff and how they don't want to do a full rebuild, like I really find it unlikely that they're going to go into this season with Kyle Trask at quarterback. I do think someone like Derek Carr or Jacoby Brissett is going to be what they're looking for and keep this offense afloat. Just the way they built their self through veteran guys. And I just can't imagine them looking Mike Evans and Godwin and these guys in the face and being like, yeah, Kyle Trask is going to throw balls to you all year. So I don't know. I think Godwin has been really consistent throughout. And so I just think he represents a, I don't know, like a fine pick in that range over a guy like Christian Watson, who I will take stabs on. I already have taken stabs on him, but that price seems a little pricey in comparison to a guy again, like DJ Moore, who's been available at like the five, six turn in all these drafts. I like Watson more. I think I saw the chat already kind of saying that Watson's going too high. Watson was fantastic last year relative to the volume that he got. Like certainly earning targets is an important part of the job, but each play he had, he did a lot with it over a 0.4 EPA last year, which would be one of the better marks in the league for a wide receiver. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for Christian Watson. I actually think the Packers, and it's kind of weird to, I, I hate quoting Bill Simmons stuff from 10 years ago because I feel like he's beaten it all into the ground so much. The Ewing theory of Aaron Rodgers being traded away, and I know he's won stuff in Green Bay, so it's not perfectly analogous. If they trade Aaron 
Aaron Rodgers away and Jordan loves the QB. You've already seen Aaron Jones give some positive quotes about him. I'm sure he's also worked a lot with Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs in practice. I feel like the Packers could actually sustain a Rodgers loss really well. It's going to be tough in the North, but I think they could be a team that like, if they're undervalued right now and that team is good, you can get all these guys at basically nothing. Aaron Jones, other guy going to like the 60s, 70s, and you could basically have the entire Packers stack. And if they're good, like they could pay off absolutely hugely. Yeah, I'm with you. Watson is really the only guy that's pricey. I think Love is a really nice quarterback to sprinkle in as well. And even A.J. Dillon, I think, is a bit mm -hmm. undervalued now where I don't think a ton actually changes for the outlook for those guys specifically, the running game and Christian Watson. I mean, we we saw what? Jordan Love and his one start that he got immediately connected with Christian Watson for a deep ball. So, I mean, the guys you would traditionally be worried about with a shift of quarterback from like Rodgers to Love would be the more short range intermediary guys. But on the Packers, that's fucking Alan Lazard and Randall Cobb and stuff like that. So it's like, who cares? Like if they can get the deep shot going and also have a good running game, kind of like basically what Justin Fields was able to do, right? Where he came in, he was able to connect with Mooney deep, some deep shots to Cole Komet. Like you don't need the intermediary parts of the field to be humming for, for still big fantasy production. And Christian Watson was pretty good in short space too. Like a lot of his touchdowns were those kind of dink and dunk catch and run plays. That certainly Aaron Rodgers excelled at a lot. Uh, but yeah, overall, I like the way that Packers offense can go if Rodgers isn't coming back. And I think certainly Watson would be a guy who's going to benefit from uh, both Alan Lazard and Robert Tanya in free agency and probably both guys not likely to come back, it seems like. Uh, so it should be a pretty open target space there for Watson if you are worried about his ADP particularly. Um, anything stand out to you? I'm actually curious about the longitudinal part of this, and it might be a little bit too long of an answer to give with our pick coming up. But you've done a lot of drafts for multiple years in a row now many years in a row. This is my first year really maxing fully and then going into another year. How do you handle the guys like a Dalvin Cook, who last year was a top 10 pick, now he's 60th. We talked about him a little bit. But like guys like that where the situation hasn't changed a lot, assuming that he actually stays on the Vikings, but now they're valued so much less. Is that like a thing where you try to take advantage of it and keep in mind that previous price tag, or is it just like an entirely new year and you kind of throw it out the window? Yeah, I feel like you, I always view it through the lens of like, where do I think this guy's stock could go like over the course of the season and then for a contest like this which what as of the other day was like 11 percent full i don't know what it's up to now when these drafts are going to take place in a specific window that's smaller i have no problem taking bigger stands and being like a full fade because i think this guy's mispriced and i actually don't think his price is going to change that much until the contest fills whereas with bbm where it's going the course of the season i'm going to say like okay i'm going to want some Dalvin Cook exposure, when can I get the best price and then try to go from there? But in a draft like this, in this contest, I don't mind taking big stands and big fades. I love Willis and Grumpy Simon in a row there going zero RB, looking beautiful. But we are on the clock again, kind of like Jackson Smith and Jigba here. Yeah, what are the, can you go to the wide receiver tab? I assume, did my guy DJ Moore go? Uh, yep, yeah. looks like he's gone. Um, yeah, I'm fine with, you've been deeper into the rookies than I have. Give me in. I was kind of shocked because like as of before he got hurt, like everyone was talking about Jackson Smith and Jigba being like the greatest wide receiver prospect we've seen in a long time. And now he's being mocked as what, like the fourth wide receiver off the board. Mm -hmm. So give me the selling point on Jackson Smith. So he's got a 0.86 EPA going back to the year before last. He didn't play this year because of a hamstring issue. Basically, it flared up, I think, in camp and then came back up again after one game. And he basically sat out the year because he thought his draft stock was okay. He's a pure slot guy, but this is a draft full of pure slot guys. So, like, he's the best pure slot guy. And it's insane to me that he and Josh Downs go anywhere close in some drafts. Um, Smith and Jigba, to me, is, like, the best slot guy. He's a Monroe St. Brown with possibly more of a ceiling uh which you know it's hard to say for a guy who's been that good we're back on the clock let me see the though, tight Pete, ends so what do you want to do let me see the tight ends tight ends we've got goddard goddard uh, I wouldn't mind goddard or pits here uh seems fun <laughs> i already got my pits exposure this morning yeah i'll take goddard i'll go goddard <laughs> <laughs> I have no issue with Pitts here, but I do think that Goddard, to me, a guy, actually the best graded tight end in terms of EPA last year, which just kind of surprised me as I was pulling together my sheet, actually gave Pete advance notice to my my ranking sheet. Did you happen to take a look at the madness that I already put in there? Uh, Chris, I feel very bad. I got the link. I planned to open it, but uh, I've had a busy afternoon. XM 12 okay. to 2, ate lunch, and then uh, sat down here. So I haven't got to look at your spreadsheet yet. 
So basically, as I mentioned on the show, I am going to do my own rankings this year. I will put them out for our subscribers because I do care about everybody knowing what I'm doing. And I actually have the prep time, hopefully, to do this. And I've basically already put together a sheet with underdog ADPs. I've also put in some of my rankings, not all of them yet. And I have the EPA for every pass play, every uh, run play as well for each player. So it works for QBs and for position players. And basically, it's going to help me make a lot of decision tree arguments here where um, a lot of these guys, I think, tend to be volume guys. You get a little bit overrated. I want the guys who are going to be superior players and then try to pair it together with them being in great spots. So I think you actually will like it because you'll know right away, at least with EPA numbers, which guys are good. Uh, but I tried to make it like a quick frame of referencing where I know like, OK, this is where this guy is. Um, he kind of underperformed, but I know the volume off the top of my head. Um, so that's what I'm hoping will help me out. But it's it's hard because like the ADPs, I think, have moved around so much that I wanted to have some sort of check against that. Yeah, no, I mean, and this is. This is the draft where, I, I mean, my early take has been, I just want to load up on these rookies, you know, after what, after round six or seven. Um, and we felt it the other night on ship chasing when we did the last draft before the rookies were included. It's like the talent pool just dries up after like seven rounds. Like, yeah, you can tell yourself stories for some guys, but like really bankable talents just doesn't exist. And these rookies become, you know, the optimal pick at a lot of these rounds. And so um, I think I tend toward more like spraying and praying on these cheaper rookies than going out of my way to, you know, take a Jackson Smith and Jigba in the fifth round. Mm. But I, I certainly get the uh, the logic behind it. Uh, so Chip asking how many rookies are too many rookies. I would say that there isn't a correct answer to that one. I think it's all relative to the ADP is like, to me, the tight ends, and if you watch my tight ends video, you know how I was obsessed with some of these guys. I think Dalton Kincaid's a monster, and I think it's nice to see some other uh, people who are certainly smarter than me about mock drafts kind of having similar takes. Uh, again, Todd McShay had him in the top 10 today, I believe. Um, so, like, guys like that, I think, are really undervalued. Dalton Kincaid right now going, I think, 205 or something. And the issue to me, too, is I was tweeting with uh, one of the guys who I like a lot on Twitter, uh, but he was like, yeah, I'm not going to draft any of the rookie tight ends. I'm going to try to get the guys who are in their second year. And it's like, no, get these rookies, because a lot of these rookies are better than the guys last year like Trey McBride was an award winner he was an award winner at Colorado State you have guys like Darnell Washington played at Georgia Michael Mayer played at uh at uh, Notre Dame and was like an elite target getter and also like played some legit teams and then there's other guys like Kincaid guys like Luke Musk uh, Luke Musgrave like these guys played real competition and they're going to be a lot better I think right away than McBride maybe even Dulcich I, it's hard to say but I think there's a chance that this there's at least some outlier talents and I think JSN is definitely one of those guys to me uh, and Bijan yeah. too, like those two are like outlier talents. Yeah. And, you know, obviously with this draft too, like thinking about the draft windows, we aren't going to get movement post draft because this is going to close before the draft. So someone like Jackson Smith and Jigba, where I think people will still be kind of like landing spot, um, uh, reactive to him. You know, I think he'll move up and down based on his landing spot. To, so, you know, you could see him. I, I have a hard time seeing him going much higher than this, um, but I could see you getting more of a discount if people don't love the landing spot. But you could also see him, like if he goes to the Chargers, who desperately are going to need like a wide receiver, like I bet he settles about in this range. Oh, if he were the new Keenan Allen, I think he would be an easy top 20 receiver. Yeah, I mean, and that's where, I mean, what is he right here? He's probably like wide receiver 24, 25. I mean, I'm not. I yeah, I mean, I, I might yeah. be undershooting it. But again, like he was so elite after the catch too and also great in close space, which I think is an important thing to look at for these rookies. Like how are they doing when things close down in college? Because that's what you're going to see all the time, basically in the NFL. Um, I think he's a strong player. I also love this pick by um, at, 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 whatever, ATOX here. Um, Taking Quentin Johnson, I think, is one thing people are also slipping on a little bit here. But we're on the clock, and we do not have Quentin Johnson available. Uh, Tyler, I, I, I say we, <laughs> I say we stack up Lamar with Bateman. I mean, Bateman oh, okay. seems like a pretty good value here. Yeah, I like that. I mean, I, I don't mind taking the injury risk here, and he was good. And it's going to be a new offense, so I kind of don't mind taking the flyer there because I'm sure a lot of people have a bad taste in their mouth for Bateman last year, and you know, certainly this is going to be a new situation for him, assuming he's going to be healthy. Yeah, and I mean, what, Bateman's ADP last year settled in, what, like the mid-fifth round? Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, you're getting, what, two-and-a-half round discount here on him? And, you know, uh, I know he's burned people, but if we're buying in on Lamar, I think if Lamar goes nuclear, Bateman's going to be a big part of that. And so we got Dotson, we've got Sutton. Kadarius Tony is getting steamed up a lot. I don't know that I want to take him here, and I've taken him, honestly, probably enough. Um I, you can make the I like, case for these guys, I think. Yeah, Dot, can you, is there anything fun to tell me about Zay Flowers? Otherwise, I like Dotson. 
I am not a Zay Flowers guy. I think he didn't play enough real competition, and I think people are too into him. I think his price is artificially high because of people, A, the fact that he played at Boston College, and B, the fact that he's like, I don't know, not that. Like, I, people are too into these slot guys. Like, slot guys are really replaceable. So the guy again, who just took Jackson, Smith, and Jigba in the fifth? <laughs> but No, but I mean, but he's in a, like, there's an elite slot guy, and then there's like Josh Downs, Zay Flowers. These guys are all just like slot guys. They're just guys you yeah. can get into the right team and be okay. Whereas like a guy who's a target earner and like an elite talent. I mean, there's a big difference. Like Smith and Jigba had a 0.86 EPA. And then let me see where Zay Flowers was. Zay Flowers, a 0.137 EPA. So we're talking 0.7 points added per target so like each time smith and jigba touches the ball he's worth 0.7 more points yeah no like, I'm, i know i'm just I giving you a... sound like a lot to people but like you think about a guy getting 150 targets or something like that matters a lot over the course of a year and that's why i think it's about superior the spags rankings pete you know what they stand for superior players in great spots and that's what <laughs> Jack i hate smith it and i hate be. it so much. go back to the drawing board go back to the drawing board <laughs> It sounds like a Michael. It sounds like something Michael Scott would say, like presenting his his rankings. Well, that you know, I like to acronym. name like my acronyms. I like to have a reason for them to exist, and that's obviously can't just be my name. So, superior players in great spots probably is probability ranked order by live yield. If Scuba. if it's if that is your if that's your name, superior players in great spots. That means your ranking list is going to be like twenty six players because you're going to have a lot of shitty players in bad spots on your rankings list. Well, no, because you're ranking them according to who's the most superior players in the greatest spots. <laughs> uh, so Chip is asking, isn't that six and great spots? So you <laughs> to be atop the ranking, you have to have a superior player and a great spot. Whereas like Saquon Barkley, great spot, not superior player. I hate it so much. You're going to have to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> Shout out to Tommy GK23 saying, or I might mix that up. Never get to watch live. Just wanted to say you guys do phenomenal work. We appreciate that, Tommy. We are here, of course, fantasy football year round. I changed our YouTube uh, cover art today because we're not doing new videos daily right now. I kind of need to recalibrate <laughs> a little after the football season. That said, there's going to be a lot of videos here, probably a lot closer to daily as the season goes on or the off season goes on. Uh, but we are going to be doing these drafts all season long. We're probably going to add another show with Pete and me uh, each week as well. So are you getting into the XFL streets this weekend, by the way? Um, I I think I'll probably get sucked in. I basically, I think I have bandwidth to add like one thing. And I'm debating if I kind of want to go a little harder at MMA, if I want to do Ooh. XFL. Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be in the streets, though. I, I won't be able to resist. I feel like you could do XFL this week, and then when the prize pool drops to 10K next week, <laughs> and you go to MMA. Yeah, I, I I'm trying to be realistic because, like you said, with the prize pools last year, I went headfirst into USFL. I made my first video for the Deposit Kingdom YouTube channel about USFL, was gung ho, and then just lost steam so quickly. But the XFL product was better and more interesting than the USFL product, and like you said ultimately everything will come down does the interest hold do the prize polls hold in it prize polls prize pools and if so i think it'll be a fun time i think too the espn part is like a really not a significant part like when did ufc make its biggest jump in terms of selling you know pay-per-views and being mainstream is when espn got the contract and actually was covering them again i'm um, saying for the nhl when they weren't on espn and they got like no coverage on sports center the xfl being on espn i think will help the casual interest which will hopefully help the prize pools and stuff and like josh gordon ben denucci and josh gordon yeah are i thought of you <laughs> when i saw ben denucci i was like us oh, fags can't wait do you know what i wish they do though and i understand why they do it from like a ratings perspective but if they just had all the games at once similar to the nfl thing and we got like an xfl red zone style product that would be so fun like don't chew up my entire weekend like i'm just i'm not gonna watch xfl all weekend but would i watch it for like a three and a half hour window like one day and have all the action going on at once. That's what I wish they would do and pander, you know, to fantasy and gamblers as best as possible. It does feel like I know our pal Justin Freeman has kind of talked about on Twitter uh, some of the struggles with the data sources for the XFL. So it feels like they perhaps didn't consider uh, some of the fantasy players first and foremost. We're on the clock, though. We got rookie Zach Charbonnet, who I like a lot, but we are uh, we do have a good amount of running backs already. Um, Jacoby Myers, a free agent. Josh Downs, a rookie. Wouldn't mind reaching for Jalen Hyatt here. I think he's an elite downfield target. 
Yeah, I'm fine with that. I also wouldn't mind uh, just doing Fryermuth and being done at tight end, although there is a lot of value late if we want to do three tight ends. We got to take some rookies. I refuse to not take one of the rookies at tight end because I think them going at like 200 plus, again, that's where Bellinger and like Dulcich and those guys went. And Dulcich had the one or two good games, but like wasn't elite week to week. I think that there people are now treating that because of what happened last year with Bellinger and McBride and, and Dulcich to a lesser extent. I think people are now treating these guys the same and they're not going to be the same because they're getting it drafted in the first round. I love it. Love the another summer of, and not to mention like all those, if, if you're stoked on the rookies and then all those second year guys, I, I, there's a lot of them that I like as well. All right. So we're on the clock again. I wouldn't hate Jacoby Myers. Cause I do think yeah. he's going to get a good landing spot. Yeah. I mean the, it see, it would be hard for him to have a downgrade in landing spot. I think with as little as they threw last year and just in that offense. So where what what did Jacoby's ADP settle at last year with New England? Like it was, is he like eleventh, twelfth rounder in most drafts? I mean, definitely late enough where it doesn't stick out. And yeah, I would say he definitely was less than he ended up being. And he was he was in part of Pat's winning lineup too, right? Uh yes, he yeah. was. It was him and Taekwon. Yeah, I mean, I think he's going to land well. He's he's probably the best free agent slot guy, I would think, at receiver. Um, but I in, unless I, you're counting Keenan, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, besides Keenan, yeah. But Keenan, though, you know, getting older, at least Jacoby's still, like, within the age we want to see. Yeah. Yeah, Jacoby Jacoby is solid for what Jacoby does, and he's also run pretty poorly in his career on touchdown expectation stuff. So um, I could definitely see things swinging back for him and having a, a, a big year. Also going to highlight Zach Charbonnet here just because we saw him get drafted. I wouldn't mind taking him, though I do think we're pretty well set at running back for a little bit here. Uh, Charbonnet, 0.221 EPA catching passes, 0.238 EPA on run plays. He was a monster at UCLA. Also, big-bodied guy, could plug into a lot of situations. So he's a running back that I think is undervalued. And also part of why Bijan could end up being a little bit overvalued. So guys like Charbonnet are there. Um, guys like uh, Roshan Johnson are there very late, who I think looks pretty good. Um, there's a lot of running backs out there who are going to be pretty good in this rookie class. I think one of the film grinder guys out there who does prospect stuff, who's like an NFL Network guy, I forget which one it was, was talking about how like he saw 10-plus starters in this rookie class at running back which I think makes this one of the most interesting drafts times to be doing right now because people don't know that yet, but like the rookies coming in might actually be taking like veteran jobs because of the contract stuff. And the fact that teams just don't want to pay running backs anymore. Yeah. And I mean, this is, this is the range right here. You know, I mean, in the summer too, historically rounds, you know, nine through 14, like that is the sweet spot for all of these zero RB guys here. And with a lot, I mean, yeah, guys like Khalil Herbert, um, and Rashad White, like I love both of those picks there. I think those are fun picks. But this is if you're going to start spraying and praying on these rookies, and you can be like me and not even know uh, what college they went to, but this is the uh, this is the range to scoop them up. I'm also like, it makes me so proud to see Tyler Algier go here. <laughs> like, it brings me actual joy to see him have come up this much. I was looking at some of the numbers the other day. I knew he had the thousand yard rushing year, but we talk a lot about the lack of importance of counting stats. He was actually the best rookie in terms of EPA, like better than Damian Pierce, better than Brees Hall, had a little bit less volume than those guys, better than Kenneth Walker. Um, he was legitimately good next last year in a way that I wasn't even aware of as we were living through it. Yeah. Uh, no, that's, uh, that's fair. And I know he was your little pet and, uh, you know, what, what percentage exposure did you end up with him in BBM? Uh, 23 or something like that. 24. Okay. Yeah. And he, he yeah, got, and there, I mean, got it, to the, the end for me. And it just goes to show that these guys don't have to be, you know, highly regarded or highly drafted guys to make a fantasy impact. I mean, he was a fucking fifth round draft pick and just the way it happens every year these guys carve out bigger roles and as long as you pair them in the right room you know that you're not taking too many zeros early on they can supercharge your team down the stretch i have to say i don't like the way spidey started with both josh allen and jalen hurts yeah he really got a nice four pack of young running backs here with algier cook rashad white cleo herbert four guys who could have the running backs next to them or ahead of them gone in free agency who also were pretty good last year and theoretically going to get better as they get older. So I would say this is a pocket where I think he absolutely nailed that pocket with Algier. Like that's a really strong four running back crew here of guys who almost inevitably going to be better than they were last year. Yeah. It's just his rookies are what are, or sorry, his wide receivers. What does he have at wide receiver? He's got, the two quarterback he's got Calvin Ridley, Brown, Jameson Williams. Yeah. So he's going to be feeling that squeeze here. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, it, it, you put yourself in a corner when you start a draft with two quarterbacks, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, if he had taken a receiver instead of one of these quarterbacks, he would have been in a actually a pretty nice spot. 
Well, he could have done well. No, we took AJ Brown, so he didn't have that stack available to him. Yeah. Also, didn't have the digs. But yeah, I, I, I just can't. That's so much draft capital to spend on two quarterbacks. Yeah, we're coming up here in two picks. Our pal Grumpy Simon, who if you missed the stream during the playoffs, Grumpy Simon Pete was one of my rivals who uh, admitted in the chat. I didn't. He's never been in our splash play community before. Came into the chat to tell me that I pissed him off during one of the <laughs> playoff best ball drafts, and he was deliberately sniping me after that point. But we're on the clock. Wow, he came back for <laughs> vengeance. Yeah, we got Zay Jones, who I think is not worth it with Ridley in the mix. Dawson Knox, Cole Komet, Kareem Hunt's a free agent. None of these guys really. Can like you my can you sell time. me on a guy like Sean Tucker? Can you make me a? a I rookie? think I think he's going to be overrated. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go his way. Madison, wow. I would consider in case Cook is not on the team. Yeah, Madison's fine. Madison, Mr. Rookie here. I toss out one rookie, and then he's like, nah. <laughs> Tucker. Well, Tucker was a guy who played at Syracuse and was just a volume back who played like like. It's funny when you watch some of the highlight reels, and when the guys, all the guys' highlights are like against Mercer, it's like, oh, this is <laughs> this is not the dude. Sean Tucker's highlight reel is all him playing Mercer and the garbage teams, and against the good teams, there's not a lot there. And again, it's all going to come down to situation. Like I could talk about these guys and what they did in college, and I could look at the SIS numbers, Sports Info Solutions that I am using for all these APA data points. Uh, but like ultimately, it's going to matter if Sean Tucker replaces Zeke and Tony. Pollard in Dallas like he's going to be a good play then right now though he is not a superior player nor in a great spot Pete <laughs> okay all right thank you that's Lesson gonna be my learned. tagline forever <laughs> just just to get you all right we're on clock again I don't mind Kareem Hunt honestly because I do think he'll sign somewhere and be useful show me the wide receiver tab okay Dobbs um I I, I like Dobbs and Rondell Moore too Ooh, he, wait oh we didn't take Watson but yeah let's do Dobbs yeah yeah, I like that. I think, honestly, the Packers being a young offense with Jordan Love, like, I think they actually have a lot of potential to make a run in the next couple of years. Like, the contract stuff's going to be weird because they're going to take probably a, a gross cap it if they have to trade Rodgers. But I think that they have a nice little core, and people don't realize it because they just want to bury the Packers and bury Aaron Rodgers and all that. But, like, Dobbs was pretty good last year. He was, and I think just because Watson came on so strong, because Dobbs uh, dealt with some injuries, and because Rodgers is likely going to be gone, that he's flying under the radar. But talk about a guy who I could see jump a good bit as we get into draft season, training camp, buzz, all that stuff. I, I think Dobbs feels to me like he should be more of like a ninth, 10th round pick, not a, a 12th. Target out pointing out that Madison is an undrafted free or uh, unrestricted free agent. Excuse me. Um, yes, he is. But I, I think that some of the reports out there that they might cut uh, cook to make some savings and then cut a longer term deal with Madison. So that's one thing there. But yes, there's there's like so many free agent guys like Miles Sanders is a free agent. Jacobs is a free agent. Barkley's a free agent. Kareem Hunt's a free Pollard. agent. Pollard's a free agent. Like that's so many guys out there with a loaded rookie class that these guys ADPs could swing wildly by the time June rolls around. Yeah, no, it's uh, the that I mean, the all of these free agency classes um, aren't that interesting, except running back is a fun one. And for like draft purposes as well, I feel like the running back class is always the funnest, too. So a lot of backfields. I think we're going to see some fun shakeups. So the first mistake I made, Pete, with the Spags rankings, uh, Romeo Dobbs, apparently a negative 0.11 EPA player last year on pass plays. So we did draft a negative player there who did not create positive value. Oh no! I'm I, the, everything I thought I knew has been shattered. I'll 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 ask Underdot if they can throw this draft out for us because we didn't follow the Spags rankings. Do you think, by the way, that um that they should start throwing the drafts out where people are taking five to eight to ten QBs in drafts? Because I've seen a lot of those on Twitter, and I think our pal Neil Orfield over at Stochastic uh, really is <laughs> tilting about it on Twitter more than others. And a way that I appreciate him advocating. But do you think that should be the case, or do you think they should just let those drafts lie and whatever happens happens? Yeah, it's it's tough. Like, I don't think there's a great solution to it. I think of my drafts as like a portfolio. And when I'm doing a bunch, I know that there's going to be some chaos in there. Or someone's going to go rogue and like, that's just part of it. But for the user who's only doing a couple of drafts, that's a pretty miserable experience for them to go in and have to deal with that. Um, and you can listen, Rudman went on the Badge Bros uh, the other day and talked about some of the challenges that they face with that stuff and having... You know, trying to let the tech flag like true collusion versus like manually overriding and throwing out other stuff. And 
Um, yeah, I wish I had a good solution for it. Uh, but yeah, I think as long as they can do as much as possible as eliminating true collusion, which they're doing with looking at IP address stuff, maybe they can start to do more audits on like people's previous drafting histories. Like, is this a one-off thing? Is this like, maybe there's more they can do there to really identify problem users and then nip it from like a user level instead of a draft level. But, uh, I don't know. I'm talking in circles. I don't have a good answer for it. I also have to say, so I like Short Gamer here, one of our regulars as well, took Bryce Young, took CJ Shroud. The one thing that stands out to me, besides the fact that both these guys are going to go probably very high, and it seems like now a lot of people are universally agreed they're going to go top five, if not top three. Um, I think that Shroud in particular, and, and Bryce Young too, because he's not a great runner, that people see the Kyler Murray kind of physicality and assume he's going to be a great runner. Um, these guys, I think, are going to get more valuable when you know where team they're going to be and you actually can stack them up. Because Shroud was the best EPA passer in college by an incredible margin, and I think better than all the rookies who came out last year in terms of EPA. And I think like if you know his targets, like if you know he's going to be on the Raiders and he's going to be with Devontae Adams, I think Adams and Shroud then is the stack you want. And I would kind of worry if you have Stroud here naked that I just don't think you're getting the full, like the full birth of what he's going to be potentially. Yeah. Um, I haven't dug into the quarterback prospect profiles quite as much as you have, but both these prices seem just a teeny bit rich to me. Like really? even taking these guys over uh, a Kenny Pickett. I mean, is Trey Lance still on the board or did Trey I Lance go? I believe so. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Uh, no, no he, Lance he, he must've gone. Oh. I heard he I is guess, the real starter. I guess it's just sticker shock to the overall price, but everyone's getting shoved up so much that I guess with what was available on the board that I don't mind it. It's just like thinking historically where these rookie quarterbacks have gone. Like when Trevor Lawrence was a rookie and that whole class, you know, the fields, the Lance, like those guys were all going later than, than these wise were going in these drafts. So it just might be the whole drafting landscape that I need to come to grips with. Yeah, I just think the rookies, like the rookie QBs at the top level are really talented. If Will Levis got steamed up here, I would tell you no. Like, I, I don't think that that guy is good. Um, I do think Anthony Richardson is greatly undervalued, but we are on the clock again. We have a one three seven one build. Um, Ty J Spears is probably going to be somewhere good. McKinnon's a free agent. Mostert's getting old. Mitchell, I don't know. I like Mitchell or the rookie if you can sell me on Spears. So Spears, positive EPA guy, played at Tulane. Um, also good camp, uh, good senior bowl reports, I believe, from what we had uh, from Football Outsiders. But let me pull up his numbers here. Tyj, 0.202 EPA on pass plays, 0.16 EPA on run plays, both positive numbers for sure. Um, and towards a higher end. So I think Spears is in a good spot. And to me, he's one of those rookies that I have no idea where he's going to go. But if he lands somewhere as a replacement for a bell cow, he's probably going to be better than that bell cow was. Yeah, um, I, I like that we we had to mix in at least uh, another rookie running back here along with Bijan. So definitely on board with that. What's our structure right now? One four seven one. Yeah, so we should be starting to think about quarterback stuff with how thin that got. Um, what are what's the quarterbacks available? Well, we could still take Jordan Love. Oh yeah, which I think we like. Yeah, I think lo Love with our already Dobbs pick, I think makes a ton of sense. And again, Anthony Richardson here. So I know a lot of people think, and even Jim Irsay uh, gave a quote saying that, oh, that kid from Bama is looking pretty good. I kind of think it's going to be misdirection that they're going to take Anthony Richardson, um, but that's neither here nor there. Richardson, to me, is the best guy relative to ADPs um, in terms of the rookie QBs. Uh, we are on the clock, though. Oof, this is a tough room. I think we just take love. I mean, there's okay. been enough quarterback runs, and we're on the backside of the board here where we don't pick for a while that I wouldn't want to get shut out and have to take like two after, you know, Tannehill or whatever. Okay. All right. He's there. We go. There goes Jordan Love. So I think he's undervalued. Like, do, there's no way Rodgers comes back to Green Bay at this point, is there? I think it's very, very slim. There's just so many negative media reports about it now where it's like clearly the team is putting some stuff out. Like, I just don't think they want him back. And it doesn't seem like it's for the best of anybody involved. No, it doesn't. Um, do you, you know, the other quarterback that looked like a decent value to me there was Sam Howell. Um, I kind of oh. like that price if he's going to be back here in the 15th, 16th round. Yeah. It does seem like the commanders are committed to giving him a start. We'll see what they do in the draft, but I have no issue with Sam Howell. I mean, we, we liked him coming in. Like we made some jokes about him looking like a guy who would have followed me back in the barstool days. But I think besides that, <laughs> he, he looked good in the one game. He was a gunslinger in college. I think he would be a fun addition to the NFC East. If only because uh, he's so far behind everybody else in terms of pure talent and ability to actually produce on the field. Yeah. I mean, in the one, the one game we saw, he looked incredible. So I, I have hopes that he can, uh, he can do it. Also, didn't we take Dotson? Yeah. So that would be, did oh. we take Jahan Dotson? 
Did we? I thought we we might have passed on him for. Yo, JSN. we did. Yeah, yeah. So like, how would be a fun third quarterback with this build too? Oh uh, yeah. All right. I guess we missed him. I, I think Love makes more sense. For, for, like, I think Love is a better quarterback. He's a bigger bodied guy. Like, I trust Love getting the job more. Whereas yeah. I think there's still a chance Howell could get thrown one of those wrinkles and they bring in like they sign Carr somehow or get Garoppolo that they've wanted for so long. Wait, not to completely derail us, but I just remembered before the show you teased me that you had a bad Super Bowl and that you're going to save it for the show. <laughs> Oh yeah, so I uh, so I asked Pete how his Super Bowl was. Obviously, you saw Pete over at the Underdog House having a great time. Uh, Pete, my Super Bowl, and I, I hate talking about things like like bodily functions. Like, yeah, sure, farts are uh -oh. funny and all that, but like, uh, I don't think that's my brand of humor. That said, Pete, I have never vomited and shit my pants more over a five day window than the Super Bowl weekend because we had a stomach bug and might have had two circling stomach bugs at the same time. Alex was sick, I was sick. It was worse for her because she was watching the Super Bowl and then. The Eagles are her favorite team and the team she grew up with and they got smoked and she was also dying, but like couldn't eat any food over the weekend was like dying, lost 13 pounds of water weight over the course of those five that days. That is so much. <laughs> yes. So, so yeah, Pete, that's the joys we get of childhood here, but it's been going around this area. So there actually is a good chance. A lot of Eagles fans were suffering from the same ailment that we were while also dealing with the Super Bowl. <laughs> Dude, I am, uh, I'm sorry to hear that. And then when, when you layer we haven't had it happen yet, but I know it's inevitable, but just layering on uh, the sickness with also having a young child just sounds like the absolute worst. Yeah. Cause the thing is like, you got to keep taking care of them. <laughs> That's the yeah. tough part. And then That's there's what they say. Too. Yeah. Like Luca was throwing up at, at one point, he didn't get it as bad as us, but it was just like a tough combo. Like I had, I've had my first real meals, like within the last 24 hours. Um, so it, it is not a good time. And it was just a funny contrast where I'm like, oh, Pete is out having a great time in like studio setups and like just underdog beers and, and low dose tequila. And I am here. And if you put that in my mouth, it would have gone. <laughs> I, I do not. I don't want to imagine it, but I, uh, you know, I, I apologize. And the fact that the the uh, the hometown Eagles for you couldn't even get the win, although maybe the rioting in your nice suburban neighborhood was a little less than it would have been otherwise. I was I was happy about that part, though I did make a pledge to, to Alex and our Valentine's Day card that I will no longer root against the Eagles in championship games because I was doing it perhaps a little actively, and uh, she didn't feel great about that <laughs> during the game, especially yeah. in the second half uh, when it resulted in me going down to the basement to watch the game, and then that led to Patrick Mahomes having a touchdown or a score on every drive. <laughs> I remember when Lauren and I had first started dating, and she was a big Patriots fan and that was when they had the Super Bowl against the Giants and you know that was the David Tyree catch I think that was 2008 um and so like me you know trying to be like a nice boyfriend and uh but secretly just hoping for the Patriots to lose and just loving every second of the David Tyree catch so you got to be careful navigating those scenarios so DJ Chark free agent who's going to be I, probably one of the best outside guys Rashad Penny I like I like Chark I think okay. that seems he could it's definitely like, get an upgrade what did he do that like Rashid Shahid actually did some stuff? DJ Chark did nothing. I, I would do Taekwon Thornton out. over Shahid. Really? Oh man. Yeah. It's What's like your rank wide Shahid Reagan. and Thornton? It, how it's their ADP. Okay. Oh shit. Oh, we got Brock. No Purdy. spags. <laughs> Our first timeout of the year, Brock Purdy. Is that a bit? Did you no. do that on purpose? <laughs> well, I'm do you not how to well, use the cue. The interface Jesus has been a little spags. bit sluggish for me today, and. <laughs> I clicked it and it did not go. God damn it. You're over there talking about Rashid Shahid. He can't even click DJ Chark in the queue. Oh, uh, now he's gone. Uh, I guess I got to take Rashid Shahid. Uh, no. <laughs> you can take Taekwon. No, you're going to you take want. Taekwon Thornton after this as punishment for taking Brock Purdy. All right, that's fine. I mean, look, you got to snipe the Brock Purdy fans out there. <laughs> I think you're sniping yourself. I am. That's a wasted pick. It's, yeah, you know, but it's 20 rounds. Whatever. We got a couple freebies. <laughs> disgusting i agree that was an error pete but again it's just a little, a little slow a little finicky today yeah the chat let spags have it it's going to be a long off season of auto drafts failed picks normally it's going to be me um but this time it's spags messing it up it happens and now this the shitty part too is now we i can't talk you in a 20th round or 19th round anthony richardson because i yep. think he's going to be the guy that produces from day one like so he's a, as a runner pete he grades out better than every running back as a QB. <laughs> and he's got a, like a 38% missed tackle rate. Um, not a great thrower, so that's going to be a hurdle. That's why I want him to go to the Colts, because I think if Shane Steichen rubs whatever magic dust he rubbed on Jalen Hurts, on Anthony Richardson, he is going to be Jalen Hurts faster than people realize. 
Um, Spags, it's it's a great sales pitch. It's uh, unfortunate that you fucked up this draft and we can't take him. Well, the good news is we have a guy coming off of a UCL tear who George Kittle said, by the way, he should be a starter or should be the starter. I saw that. I thought like that, that was like a, that's kind of a crazy quote for him to come out and say this early in the process that it was his job to lose that. I definitely raised my eyebrows at that. Not saying I, that you like not wrong for the locker room. Yeah. Yeah. But just that he would kind of come out and say that when the front office has been like, this is going to be a quarterback battle between Lance and Purdy. But uh, it seems like the locker room has their, their favorites already. It bums me out. Cause like Lance was a guy too. It's not like he wasn't there when he was hurt. Like we saw him on the sidelines, like he was involved, but I think that's a pretty strong, that's a pretty strong indoctrination. I think of Trey Lance, which I still love Trey Lance. Like I'll hold the candle. If he somehow gets traded to Tennessee, like I'll be right there for it. Cause I think they'll run him 15 times a game and we'll see what he's got. But I think like, I think the Niners do not trust Trey Lance, which sucks because they're a really good team. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. I mean, if they by their actions, we'll know how much they trust him. Right. Because if they don't bring in a third quarterback and Purdy's, you know, rehab isn't on schedule, they're almost de facto saying like, yeah, Trey Lance is going to be our starter week one. Um, so I don't know. I feel like their actions will tell us. That's a legit proof. Nothing in the NFL. I think that's a fair point. I mean, I will say for Trey Lance, I went again, I was pulling these numbers. Trey Lance's EPA last year on throws and he didn't play, played like what? One and a half games, negative 0.52 EPA per throw. So when he did throw the ball, he was not doing much with it. And yeah, hopefully that would have improved over the course of a year, but I would be alarmed if I were, if like, if I were George Kittle, I knew my future was tied to this guy. It's like, okay, you you played and like you did nothing and then Brock Purdy comes in and he's a nobody and he made it a lot better for him. Yeah, but you can do that argument in the small sample size with any of the rookies, CJ Stroud. You can do it with Sam Howell. You can do it with Jordan Love. You can do it with Trey Lance. You, you can do it with Desmond Ritter. Like there is some, you know, leap of faith that you're taking with these guys and we're ultimately just drafting profiles of the guys who can theoretically put up big fantasy seasons. So it's always been a leap of faith with Trey Lance. Um, I don't think anything has really changed. Uh, I'm also seeing, by the way, that Rashad Penny went last round. Rashad Penny, I'm going to point out, uh, one of the best EPAs in the league for a guy who had a starters level carries for some amount of games, 0.2 EPA on run plays last year. He's a free agent. I think Rashad Penny is one of those guys where if you're negotiating with Saquon and Saquon asks for 15 mil, you go, I'll sign Rashad Penny for three mil and be really happy with that. I think he's going to land in a really good spot for that reason because he's like a really good lever against the guys who are probably going to want too much money. Yeah, I was, I was curious because I hadn't heard much about Rashad Penny lately coming back from that ankle injury and kind of where he was at, but I assume he's what? He's supposed to be fully fully ready by the time training camp starts? It's just crazy that he's this low, and yeah, I think he'll be full ready, but like Brees Hall is not getting discounted, and Javante Williams is. like The Brees Hall ADP, I think, is the biggest mistake ADP right now in an entire draft board. Uh I, I guess I kind of disagree with that. And people have let me know that the Javante Williams ACL tear was a much more significant one than the standard and that there was uh, tears in multiple spots with his meniscus or whatever the Twitter doctors say about it. So I guess I understand why there's a bit of a gap there, but I don't know. I don't, I don't mind the Brees Hall price. I mean, I think he should be like going right around where like Barkley's going. I guess he, he would have been a first rounder then if he didn't tear his ACL. I think so. I think he would have been a top five pick if he played the whole season last year. I think he was about to scorch the earth. Okay. I, I I guess I could see it. I just like, I don't want to take a guy coming off an ACL tear at a running back position where they're probably going to draft somebody or, or sign somebody who could take enough of a share. Like, I just don't think you, I don't know how you get the return on Brees Hall with where he's going. If he is going to be slow to ramp up or, or even miss like the first month of the year. Um, but I Robert, haven't heard, ha- heard anything that's going to be bearish about his timeline coming back. Uh, um, so we're on the clock here. We got a bunch of rookies. Chase Brown, I, I dude, do not like. Hey, Go ahead. We can still take a third tight end, but let's take Isaiah Likely with Lamar. Okay. All right. Let's Likely was Lamar. really good. Um, should have his role grow. Has contingent value, obviously, if something happened to Mark Andrews and we're already stacking up the Ravens. GA has watched enough of these streams. This is a batshit take. <laughs> I draft, I draft recklessly. <laughs> you you can't let you can't let GA get under your skin. He he knows how to do the the trolls. Uh, he's very good at it. Got to brush him off. I, I feel like we've done a good job, Pete, and you and especially with the Deposit Kingdom have done a good job having a community of that's very welcoming and kind. GA stands out like a <laughs> like in a he does it to, <laughs> he it's just GA. He does it to Badge Bros. He does it to me. You just got to put him in his place. 
Unbelievable. Um, Kendry Miller also getting a lot of steam. I think this is a really nice rookie pocket. Dwayne McBride is a pure rusher, can't catch passes. Roshan Johnson was Bijan Robinson's backup, is a monster human being size-wise, but also is better than Bijan on a per-play basis. And Kendry Miller's been getting a lot of steam, but I don't know that I'm quite as much of a believer in him. Yeah, uh, any oh. of those guys. I- or Dalton what? Kincaid and take our third tight end. <laughs> Will Kincaid make it back or which I don't you, think I'll so. let you choose. You're the rookie whisperer right now. Dalton Kincaid, Pete, is going to be our next Travis Kelsey was <laughs> my proclamation. He is a monster. I'm not biased because he destroyed USC, put up 200 receiving yards in a game against USC. That doesn't matter. Dalton Kincaid, former basketball player, but he is like nimble as shit. He is. Wait, we have a tight end who used to play basketball. I know it's crazy. You never hear about that. <laughs> Wow, I can't wait to drop that nugget. In multiple but I think Dalton Kincaid, there. like I said it on the tight end video I did, if Dalton Kincaid went into Dalton Schultz's spot next year, and not because they're both named Dalton, but because I think Dalton Schultz is like the definition of an average guy in a good spot, Dalton Kincaid would be putting up top five tight end numbers. If I didn't know that he played basketball, I would for sure say that's the most lacrosse sounding ass name I've ever heard in my life. Did Dalton <laughs> Kincaid. I mean, if that guy doesn't wear Abercrombie, I mean, color be shocked. He, he also like looks exactly like I think you might be thinking. Let me see if I can pull a photo here. But I remember because I pulled up a headshot to do the video. Oh, here, I'll share this screen real fast. I, I can't uh, wait to have. <laughs> I, I, I need like a puka shell necklace. Okay, yes, this is this is total Dalton Kincaid right here. But he is like a monster. He's like 6'4", um, so maybe a little bit more dulcet size than you would like to see. But I think it be uh, like good muscle on him. So I think he'll be okay on that front. <laughs> good muscle on him, he says, <laughs> while hovering his mouse over his bicep. Pete, this is what it means to be a draft, Nick. You got to objectify men. You got to be weird about their body. <laughs> Just how it goes. Goodness. Uh, there goes Anthony Richardson. Great pick by by Grumpy Simon there. I think Richardson is going to be going to be somebody. Yeah, anyway, Willis is going to take Kincaid, the- so I'm glad I took Kincaid. Yeah, uh, Willis also took Rashad Penny. I think I think you're just tipping all of these picks to Willis is what's happening. I hope so. I mean, look, follow our lead here. I think there's you know I think there's certainly some rookies I would avoid. I guess my avoid rookies would be um, if I were going to talk about that a little. I'm trying to think wide receiver. I think it's Zay Flowers and Josh Downs. I just don't see elite stuff from them, not elite size. I I see if they test really well at the combine. I think Zay Flowers might test out of the roof at the combine um, in terms of his speed. Uh, But I think there's a lot of guys that I think are overvalued, whereas Jalen Hyatt, undervalued. Smith and Jigba, undervalued. Quentin Johnston, too. I think he's going to get steamed up in the mock draft world, which is going to make him come up ADP-wise. People don't like Quentin Johnston. He, He There's like I said to somebody on Twitter, there's a better than one in 10 shot that he's going to be DeAndre Hopkins is, is my gut read on Quentin Johnson. I would say maybe closer to wow. two out of 10. That's a, that's a bullish comp uh, right there. I like it. He had a, let's see, 38% missed tackle rate in college, 8.9 yards, yards after the catch, 31% target per out run rate, like elite metrics across everything with a shitty QB. Like Max Duggan wasn't anybody of note and he's, that's why he's not going to get drafted anywhere. Uh, but people are like weird about Quentin Johnson. He's 6'4, 215. There's nobody in this draft uh, at receiver who's 6'4, 215 besides Quentin Johnson. Okay. All right. You you have me sold. And a lot of people think he's going to be the first wide receiver off the board, right? Yeah. Actually, I think I mixed it up earlier. I said that Kincaid went top 10. I think he went top 10 in um, in Mel Kuyper's draft. But uh, in Todd McShay's draft, Quentin Johnson went to the Texans, I think, at 10. And the logic was like, they need a guy for Bryce or for whoever they mocked. I think they had mocked uh, CJ Stroud. But they were like, CJ yeah. Stroud is the number one weapon. Quinton Johnson is the number one weapon. I think Quinton Johnson is like, I don't know why people are fudding him, to be honest. Like, I don't know why people are down on him because he's the only guy who has the skill set in the draft besides maybe Marvin Mims. Also, uh, shout out to Methology who popped up in the chat for his first chat of the day saying, can girlfriend for Dalton. Uh, I think that's <laughs> horny speak for he's now searching on Instagram for Dalton Kincaid's girlfriend. <laughs> I would be curious to see because uh, he played at Utah, so I don't know. I don't know what his uh, his religious leadings are. Is it going to be a nice little Mormon girl? Is it going to be? I don't know. It's Dalton Kincaid with that. Please name. don't ever Mormon. say a nice little Mormon girl on these airways. It just really makes me uncomfortable. Uh, Mormon gal? Is that better? You just it just sounds like you are running a harem and you're like married to all these little Mormon girls. <laughs> the the sister wives of Mormonhood. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Chris Spags' sister wives. Spags, uh, <laughs> spe- special women in my harem. Uh, don't check my acronym. 
<laughs> All right. We got this is a tough pocket right here, by the way. <laughs> CEH, Mac Hollins, Gus Edwards. Um, I think now might be time to reach off the board, huh? Yeah, take um, a rookie. Take All right. Well, let's let's look for oh come on. Don't lag on me. Don't lag on me. Oh, put Martin someone Mims in the queue first. Put put someone in the queue first. Put Matt Collins in the queue. All right. Uh, and then find. I don't a, like Tillman. I don't like Rakeem Jarrett. What about Israel? No, I think he's. I don't think he's that great. Yeah, okay, I think I, think I can't help fine. you. Yeah, Hollins. Hollins is it. I think that's fine. Because like, if they do get Stroud, like he's going to be in a really good spot. I think it just depends who the Raiders get at QB. Um, but like Stroud is a guy the Raiders seem to get a lot in mocks and. If they get Shroud, like I think he's the guy that actually can make the Raiders run the right way. Pull up Mathologies chat. Oh. <laughs> Confirm, he had to go to TikTok. This poor, this poor guy was on Instagram and couldn't find her and had to go to TikTok to find her. <laughs> he cares about his craft. That is why he's our resident horn dog. That's why he's the king of the pillow. Get us a running back, Spags. All right. You want to go Gus Edwards and just push our chips in on this Ravens build? Mm, okay let's do that i mean I, it does feel like just, i mean you can go to go to running backs let's see some other names okay i'm just the sluggishness on this end is making me worry a little uh eric gray I is a good rookie. i mean rookie okay let's do a rookie okay. eric gray uh, let me pull up his numbers here uh 0.154 epa on runs uh look pretty good at oklahoma i think is a little bit undervalued here uh it's weird to me because he looks better than sean tucker in every advanced analytic but sean tucker goes 50 picks higher so i think that's an okay value so, so i'll read out our yeah. final team here we got lamar jackson jordan love brock purdy <laughs> Bijan robinson josh jacobs alex madison Ty J Spears, Eric Gray, a little thin at running back, perhaps. AJ Brown, JSN, Rashad Bateman, Jahan Dotson, Jalen Hyatt, Jacoby Myers, Romeo Dobbs, Tyquan Thornton, Mac Hollins, and then Dallas Goddard, Isaiah Likely, and the man who started it all, the man who will be the next Travis Kelsey, Dalton Kincaid at tight end. Uh, I like this team. Uh, we have some stacks. We're concentrated on a couple of teams. We got a Eagles position with Goddard and AJ Brown. We got a New England position with Thornton, I guess, if Jacoby leaves. Um, but we have a big Baltimore stack, a lot of rookies going on here. So uh, I feel like this is a, a nice team. Yeah. I do. Mark Andrews isn't a free agent, right? Like he's definitely coming back, or you would think. Yeah. Okay. But he, but he might, is your, I guess, is your thought that they're just going to get likely more involved and that Andrews kind of comes back down? I like, likely was just really good on a per play basis to the point where if they don't address pass catcher, like they're going to need to rely on him. And they, the way they were using him was almost just as a, a true pass catcher and not really an inline tight end. So I think there's ways he could pay off this tag at, you know, what, pick 202. And then he has massive contingent upside if something happened to andrews i mean he'd be like a top eight weekly tight end play i'm just gonna highlight luke musgrave here and also the guy who short gamer just took darnell washington both guys who uh gonna be first second round tight ends depending on where it goes but darnell washington is six seven um huge guy i worry about him able to hold up over the load of just getting hit over and over again uh, but he was a great player at georgia a guy that i think is gonna look really good and luke musgrave was fantastic uh playing at oregon state i believe uh, but overall, his numbers look really good. He was actually really good as a downfield catcher, which you don't see a lot of tight end. Basically didn't get targeted between the one and 10-yard line. was only targeted past the sticks. Um, so I think those are two guys I want to highlight because I don't think Luke, Luke Musgrave should not get drafted in a draft. Yeah. All right. Let's name this one SP first draft of 2023. Yay, we did it. Any any final thoughts, Pete? Any any Arizona gossip that you want to save? I guess I didn't say for us, but while I try to name the team one more time, um, Arizona gossip. Um, Nick Rudman can lift my body weight times two uh, a lot of times. Uh, let's see here. Uh, we had we had a, we had some fun dinners uh, for Super Bowl. They just ordered a shit ton of In and Out uh, Burger, Ooh. which was uh, which was pretty fun as someone who's an East Coaster that doesn't get to indulge. In uh, in and out, that was beautiful to just have uh, unlimited in and out. So you're not one of those um, that thinks it's overrated, right? No, no, no. Okay. I mean, when I was in San Diego, I did prefer California burritos to in and out, but I I love in and out. Yeah, in and out. I think that it's weird because like I'm an East Coaster, but I went to LA. I was like in and out. I completely get it, especially if you get the fries well done and you get the animal style and all that stuff. 
Um, but in and outs great. And I, I enjoyed your content as well. I got to give Pete credit. You filled in well as like a studio guy, looked casual, got your takes in. I give you full credit for being able to do some different means besides just being comfy in the studio like I am. Uh, hey, I appreciate that. I also have, uh, I, you know, I forced myself spags to record some little snippets and, uh, been working with my guy, Lou should have a little video out like a quasi vlog, despite how awful that term is. Uh, so a little video recap of the weekend should be able to have that out shortly as well. Fear the feathers roasting his own team, but Pete, what are you doing content wise? Like, what does the schedule look like for you? Do you have, have you made any formal announcements to the people about what to expect from Pete this spring? Um, no, uh, I think, uh, I did mention on Twitter, someone asked me, I am going to bring back best ball breakfast on Monday. So I had, I like doing those Monday morning shows, did the GPP review, obviously in season last year. I think I waited until best ball mania launched to do, um, best ball breakfast, but you know, we're all having fun drafting. So I'm going to fire those up on Monday mornings at 10, try to get that rolling. Um, otherwise like next week I'm off for fantasy life. The whole kind of, uh, operation is shutting down for the week. So, you know, start working on some little projects. Maybe I'll try to record some TikToks. you know, just, uh, enjoy my time off. All right, so make sure to follow Pete at Peter Overzet. Of course, subscribe to this channel. Hit the like button. Leave a comment. Again, fantasy football all year is what we do here. As you can tell, um, I've spent probably too much time preparing for this year already. Uh, but we're going to keep doing here. NFL draft season is going to be fun. Free agency comes in just a month as well. We're going to be covering that here as well as all the machinations, what happens with all that. So subscribe down below, of course. Like the video. Leave a comment. Follow me at Chris Spags. Follow Pete at Peter Overzet. And follow this show at Splash Play Pod. Any final words for you, Pete? How do you feel about this first draft? You you feel like the Spags rankings, the superior players in great spots, were really firmly cemented for you. Um, yeah, I mean, it feels like you spent so much time diving deep into the rookies that you forgot how to use a queue. And so that <laughs> I think will be a problem. You need to know how to draft first, and then knowing the rookies come second. So as long as you get your priorities in order, we should be fine. All right, so we're going to keep doing these. Pete and I will be back next week at some time. Um, not on Friday, though, because I'm going to be on Luca duty. Uh, Alex is going out of town. So uh, stay tuned to the channel. I'm not sure. We'll have some shows coming up here, but probably more of me doing stuff in the afternoons and all that. Appreciate each and every one of you guys for hanging out here, and we will see you guys again soon. So good luck on the big board.